Section 3. No Animal Food, Chapter 3. Ethical Considerations. The primary consideration in regard to the question of diet should be, as already stated, the hygienic. Having shown that the non-flesh diet is the more natural and the more advantageous from the point of view of health, let us now consider which of the two, vegetarianism or omnivorism, is superior from the ethical point of view. The science of ethics is the science of conduct. It is founded, primarily, upon philosophical postulates without which no code or system of morals could be formulated. Briefly, these postulates are a. Every activity of man has as its deepest motive the end termed happiness. b. The happiness of the individual is indissolubly bound up with the happiness of all creation. The truth of A will be evident to every person of normal intelligence. All arts and systems aim consciously or unconsciously at some good, and so far as names are concerned, everyone will be willing to call the chief good by the term happiness, although there may be unlimited diversity of opinion as to its nature and the means to attain it. The truth of B also becomes apparent if the matter is carefully reflected upon. Everything that is en rapport with all other things, the pebble cast from the hand, alters the center of gravity in the universe. As in the world of things and acts, so in the world of thought, from which all action springs. Nothing can happen to the part, but the whole gains or suffers as a consequence. Every breeze that blows, every cry that is uttered, every thought that is born, affects through perpetual metamorphoses every part of the entire cosmic existence. We deduce from these postulates the following ethical precepts. A wise man will, firstly, so regulate his conduct that thereby he may experience the greatest happiness. Secondly, he will endeavor to bestow happiness on others, that by so doing he may receive, indirectly, being himself a part of the cosmic whole, the happiness he gives. Thus, supreme selfishness is synonymous with supreme egoism, a truth that can only be stated paradoxically. Applying this latter precept to the matter in hand, it is obvious that since we should so live as to give the greatest possible happiness to all beings capable of appreciating it, and as it is an indisputable fact that animals can suffer pain, and that men who slaughter animals needlessly suffer from atrophy of all finer feelings, we should therefore cause no unnecessary suffering in the animal world. Let us then consider whether, knowing flesh to be unnecessary as an article of diet, we are, in continuing to demand and eat flesh food, acting morally or not. To answer this query is not difficult. It is hardly necessary to say that we are causing a great deal of suffering among animals in breeding, raising, transporting, and killing them for food. It is sometimes said that animals do not suffer if they are handled humanely and if they are slaughtered in abattoirs under proper superintendence. But we must not forget the branding and castrating operations, the journey to the slaughterhouse, which, when transcontinental and transoceanic, must be a long, drawn-out nightmare of horror and terror to the doomed beasts we must not forget the insatiable cruelty of the average cowboy. We must not forget that the animal inevitably spends at least some minutes of instinctive dread and fear when he smells and sees the spilt blood of his forerunners, and that this terror is intensified when, as is frequently the case, he witnesses the dying struggles and hears the heart-rending groans. We must not forget that the best 
contrivances sometimes fail to do good work, and that a certain percentage of victims have to suffer a prolonged death agony owing to the miscalculation of a bad workman. Most people go through life without thinking of these things. They do not stop and consider from whence and by what means has come to their table the flesh food that is served there. They drift along through a mundane existence without feeling a pang of remorse for or even thought of the pain they are accomplices in producing in the subhuman world. And it cannot be denied, hide it how we may, either from our eyes or our conscience, that however skillfully the actual killing may usually be carried out, there is much unavoidable suffering caused to the beasts that have to be transported by sea and rail to the slaughterhouse. The animals suffer violently from seasickness and horrible cruelty, such as pouring boiling oil into their ears and stuffing their ears with hay which is then set on fire, tail-twisting, etc., has to be practiced to prevent them lying down, lest they be trampled on by other beasts and killed. For this means that they have to be thrown overboard, thus reducing the profits of their owners or of the insurance companies, which, of course, would be a sad calamity. Judging by the way the men act, it does not seem to matter what cruelties and tortures are perpetuated, what heinous offenses against every humane sentiment of the human heart are committed, it does not matter to what depths of satanic callousness man stoops, provided always that, this is the supreme question, there is money to be made by it. A writer has thus graphically described the scene in a cattle boat in rough weather. Quote, helpless cattle dashed from one side of the ship to the other amid a ruin of smashed pens with limbs broken from contact with hatchway combings or winches, dishorned, gored, and some of them smashed to mere bleeding masses of hide-covered flesh. Add to this the shrieking of the tempest and the frenzied moanings of the wounded beasts, and the reader will have some faint idea of the fearful scenes of danger and carnage, the dead beasts advanced perhaps in decomposition before death ended their sufferings, are often removed literally in pieces. And on End the quote. railway journey, though perhaps the animals do not experience so much physical pain as traveling by sea, yet they are often deprived of food and water and rest for long periods and mercilessly knocked about and bruised. They are often so injured that the cattlemen are surprised they have not succumbed to their injuries. And all this happens in order that the demand for unnecessary flesh food may be satisfied. Those who defend flesh eating often talk of humane methods of slaughtering, but it is significant that there is considerable difference of opinion as to what is the most humane method. In England, the pole-ax is used. In Germany, the mallet. The Jews cut the throat. The Italians stab. It is obvious that each of these methods cannot be better than the others, yet the advocates of each method consider the others cruel. As Lieutenant Powell remarks, this, quote, goes far to show that a great deal of cruelty and suffering is inseparable from all methods, end quote. It is hard to imagine how anyone believing he could live healthily on vegetable food alone could, having once considered these things, continue a meat-eater. At least, to do so, he could not live his life in conformity with the precept that we should cause no unnecessary pain. How unholy a custom, how easy a way to murder he makes for himself, who cuts the innocent throat of the calf, and hears unmoved its mournful plaint, and slaughters the little kid, whose cry is like the cry of a child, or devours the birds of the air which his own hands have fed. Ah, how little is wanting to fill the cup of his wickedness! 
what unrighteous deed is he not ready to commit 